where we find ourselves tonight. The Apostle Paul has been used by the Lord to birth the church there in the city of Corinth. And not only to birth it, but to invest 18 months, 18 very precious months of his life and his public ministry into the establishing of, of a church there in Corinth. But it was not all um, easy for Paul because Paul had his detractors in Corinth. And there were those that looked for every opportunity to find fault in him and win Paul had laid out his plans and his desire to visit them and to spend the winter with them uh, on his way uh, to bringing the offering to Jerusalem. All of it was Lord willing, but when those plans did not pan out, God had other plans in mind. There were those that were quick to accuse him of, of being a man who was not a man of his word. You couldn't trust him. Just when you think that um, it couldn't get any more painful than that uh, for the Apostle Paul, he had detractors in Corinth that were even more vicious than that. They were false teachers there. Uh, he stood strongly against them. They were Judaizers teaching legalism and, and um, works as a way of salvation. And so they came and piled on even, even further and said, if you can't trust his word that he's going to visit us, then you can't trust his doctrine. And they were looking for an opportunity to undermine his doctrine because it, it came against what it was that they were teaching. And so they were uh, slandering Paul in all of this. And Paul responded to all that was happening there and said, listen, in effect, the proof of the truthfulness of the gospel that I preach to you. It's not true because I said it, even as an apostle. The truth was testified to, and the gospel was testified to by a greater voice than mine. It was testified to by the Holy Spirit Himself. And He reminded them that they were born again. Not because He preached the gospel, but because He preached the gospel and God confirmed the truthfulness of that gospel, that when they believed in Jesus unto salvation, they were born again and the church was established. It was the Holy Spirit that bore witness to the veracity of the truthfulness of, of the Word of God. And then finally, he spoke to them at the end of verse 23 and 24 of chapter 1 as we left it last time. He said, well, if the truth be fully known, and I don't know, there are sometimes I talk with people and, uh, and I, I try never to use the phrase, I always correct myself, I think, where sometimes someone will say, well, you know, to be honest with you, well, we don't want to really be saying that as Christians. <laughs> We're supposed to always be honest with people. And, and so uh, sometimes I'll say, well, to be completely open with you, because we're to always be honest, but uh, we are more or less open with, with people. And uh, sometimes there's a lot of things that are on a person's heart that they would be glad to say to a person if the person would just ask them why they did what they did. And that's why the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, if we think someone has sinned against us, go to the person and allow them the opportunity to clarify that. And all anyone had to do to the Apostle Paul was just come to him and say, listen, we're confused about... You, you had made plans to come. You didn't come. What, what was the deal in all of that? And it would have been real simple then for Paul to say, that's what I plan to do in the will of God. But God had other plans. And if the truth be fully known, I didn't have a problem with God changing the plans because I didn't want to come to you as a prover and a corrector one more time. I wanted to come to you and receive edification from you and be an encourager to your faith. And so he said in verse 1 of chapter 2, But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. He wrote that first epistle to them with tremendous sorrow. It was a largely corrective epistle. And he said, You know, uh, been there and done that. I'd rather come to you in a, different, in a different way. And so I wasn't displeased that the plans did change. 
because I wanted to come to you in a different way. For if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful uh, by me? And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I came I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. Paul said, listen, I want to come to you again. And uh, what I want this experience to be is an experience that is uh, enjoyable for both you and for me. We both uh, need it. But out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you that first epistle that he wrote to them, so corrective. And he said he wrote it with many tears. Now, we don't think of the Apostle Paul um, you ever picture him crying? I mean, I picture him getting up from the stoning and walking back into the city. And I picture him preaching boldly in the synagogues, reasoning from the Scriptures and persuading from the Scriptures concerning the things of the Lord. But it, it takes a passage like this for me to stop and to think about the Apostle Paul weeping, to see him And and he speaks not only of weeping, but of many tears. You know, sometimes I I think about um, if God ever took me out of being a pastor and then I became a part of a local fellowship, some, some of the things that I would then take, try to take into that local fellowship as a Um, a member of a body away from being one of the pastors in the church. And one of the things that I I would do, I I I would hope by the grace of God, is that I would support leaders. And I'm not talking about any internal thing here at all. But, but in this body or wherever God has you fellowshipping on Sunday mornings or wherever you're going to end up fellowshipping, or I am for the rest of our lives, to stop and really think about the price that leaders pay to address problems in the body of Christ. And the Apostle Paul here, it was no easy thing to write that first epistle. Um, so often, we don't really have it, but we think we have it. As a, as a you know, kind of a regular member of the body of Christ or whatever, we see a problem, we see disobedience, we see something that needs attention, and we think we have the luxury of being able to look at that and say, I'm not getting near that, I'm not going to touch it with a ten-foot pole. It is like a cop responding to a uh, domestic violence issue. Um, the whole thing's going to blow up on him. Nobody's, everybody's going to lose here on this thing. Anybody that touches it. But, but the pastor, the leader, he, he does not have that luxury of ignoring those issues. He must deal with those things. And I don't know of a... And I, I'm not the old wise owl, but I've been doing what God has called me to do for 18 years. And I know a lot of pastors in this community, and I know a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors, really from all over the world, a lot of of ministers. And I don't know a single one that enjoys disciplining in the body of Christ and correcting people in the body of Christ. It it takes a a greater toll than teaching 10,000 sermons and the spiritual warfare that surrounds that to address difficulty in light of the Scriptures, and then to make a stand in the light of the Scriptures, and then watch when a person must be disfellowshipped because they continue in their sin, watch the family divide, watch family and friends pulled out of a body into God knows what, and all of the nightmare that rebellion brings into the body of Christ. And He has no ability to escape that. And so pray for the rest of your lives and your ministries. Pray for those that don't have the so-called luxury, though none of us have that luxury, of of being able to ignore those things. They pay an enormous price, an enormous price, to make those stands. And Paul speaks about it here. He talks about much affliction, anguish of heart. I wrote to you with many tears. Not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly toward you. What was the motive of the letter that he wrote to them? 
I mean, he said some really tough things to them. He said, you know, the only reason I wrote that letter was love. And only love will write a letter like that. (laughs) Because self-love, love love for the other person, self-love will never write it. Self-love is too into, it's too into self-preservation. It looks at it and says, there's no way I'm getting in the middle of that. But when a person loves another person and says, no, I cannot sit on my hands and watch them destroy themselves and the lives of other people, I have to get involved. Whatever the price is going to be paid, let's say it takes love to enter into those situations. And Paul said, that was my motive the love which I have so abundantly for you. But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. Now, Paul returns to a disciplinary issue that he spoke about in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where there was a man who attended the church at Corinth, and he was sleeping uh, with his stepmother, his father's wife engaged in actually engaged in actively engaged in sexual immorality and the leadership was so weak in Corinth that not only did they not address it but they they boasted in how liberal they were to allow such things to happen and and so so Paul returns now to this situation Paul had said at that time he said if you won't judge it I will judge it from a distance put him out Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Don't let him enjoy the blessings of the body of Christ and then be camped in sin in the world. Remove the blessings of fellowship with God's people so that he will then long for those blessings greater than he longs to satisfy the lusts of his flesh and he might repent and he might return to God. You know, the beautiful thing happened is is the church at Corinth, they obeyed what Paul commanded them to do. And the interesting thing is, he turned back to God. You know the great things about being a Christian? Is that once we really come to know him, and he comes into our life, and we begin to walk with him, we begin to, in the word of the psalmist, taste and see that the Lord is good. When a person's really been born again, we've been forever spoiled for the world. God will never, ever let us be successful in sin again. We will never enjoy it as much as we once enjoyed it. And it was only pleasurable for a season. And God was working on this guy's heart. And so he repents. But remember, Paul had spoken to them and said, Listen, I judge from a distance. Put him out. So now it's time to restore him back into fellowship. And they probably want to do that, but they don't understand Paul's mind on it. So they say, well, you know, we, it looks like repentance. He ought to be brought back into fellowship and all. But we don't want to know, do anything without knowing Paul's mind on it. And so Paul comes in and writes this and says, listen, there's repentance. I'm with you. It doesn't offend me. Our hearts are united together. Uh, let's bring him back into fellowship. He said, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So they had followed Paul's command to disfellowship him. They had done it uh, as a church. He said, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. So when there is that church discipline has to be enacted, or or an excommunication needs to occur, and thankfully it is a very rare um, experience. It has been for us and and all. Once there is, as apparently happened in this man's life, there was a confession of his sin. He repented of his sin. And now there is, as Paul speaks about his sorrow in verse 7, godly sorrow works repentance. He is deeply sorrowed and, and broken over Um, his sin and what he had done. And Paul said, now it's time to forgive him. It's time to comfort him so that he isn't swallowed up with too much sorrow. And so he doesn't go down into condemnation. And, you know, we don't have to sin as grievously in in the eyes of the world or at the body of Christ as, as this man did here. To know what it is to fail and to know what it is to feel the condemnation of the devil 
and to think that I'm through, I've, I've lost, there's no more chances, I'm out, I'm never going to enjoy fellowship with God again or fellowship with God's people and all that's found in, in gathering together. You know, there's nothing like what happened in this room tonight in worshiping the Lord except in other rooms like this all over this city. You'll never get this at the Brendan Theater. And I'm, not, and I'm not picking specifically on the Brendan Theater, whatever the other one is too. We can do, but, I, but it can be anywhere. It can be the mall. No one, what happens where two or more are gathered in the name of the Lord and, and where there's a group of people come together to worship, that doesn't happen any place else. And it's a blessing. And, to, and to, to lose it is to miss it when God's working in our life. So here he is, he's, he's, he's falling into condemnation, a hopelessness that he can ever have that again. And Paul says, listen, wherever a sinner is repentant, there's no need for him to go into condemnation. And there's no need for him to get swallowed up in sorrow. Now's the time to forgive and to comfort him. When any of us sins and we fall short, can you change your past? You can't change your past any more than I can change my past. So what's the best that I can bring to people that I've sinned against? I I can bring them the confession of my sin, asking for their forgiveness, and let them see a repentant life, a life that's turned back to the things of God, and then to receive from them their forgiveness and their comfort. And that's what we're to extend to people when there is that brokenness and there is that repentance, to say, yes, I forgive you now, and then to comfort him bring him back into the fold. And therefore, he said, I urge you, reaffirm your love to him. For to this end, I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. So Paul, kind of, he wrote that and he said, well, I don't know if they're going to obey in Corinth on what I tell them to do there. This is a hard thing to do. And to their credit, uh, they obeyed uh, the Lord in all of this. Now, whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. I join with you in this forgiveness. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So Paul's talking about two devices of the enemy against the body of Christ that we're not to be ignorant of. And and they were two things. One device... The church at Corinth had already fallen fallen prey to. And the second device, he's trying to make sure that they don't fall uh, prey to it here. So in this uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the two devices, number one is sin in the camp. And and so uh, remember Achan in the book of Joshua where they went in and they took the city of Jericho and God spoke to the children of Israel and said, Listen, everything in Jericho is mine. It's the first fruits. Nobody takes any of the spoil. It's mine. And there was a guy by the name of Achan, and he was so appropriately named by the time the story got uh, un- unfolded. He ends up stoned. But, but he, he took uh, 200 you know, uh, pieces of silver. He took a wedge of gold and a Babylonian garment. He took what belonged to God. And then when they went to the second city in the conquest and the taking of the land, they went to a city called Ai, much smaller city, and they attacked that city and they were defeated and 36 people died. And, and all of a sudden, uh, Joshua and the children of Israel, the leaders, they fall on their face and they say, oh no, God, you know, what's happening here? And we're going to be defeated by our, our enemies if, they, if word gets out, you know, that we've, we've been defeated by such a small city like Ai and all. And, and so God spoke to Joshua and he said, listen, stand up. Now, there's a time to get on your face and, and, and pray and, and all those things. But this is a different kind of situation. There's sin in the camp. And, and, he, and he gave Joshua this whole means by which to identify the person that had brought sin among God's people. And, and, and one of the great lessons of that whole incident in concerning Achan and Ai was it was just one man that stole. And the whole camp, we're talking about, you know, maybe three million uh, that, uh, in number of the children of Israel. One man stole from God, but 36 people died over it. And, and what that tells us is that, that my sin affects the rest of the body of Christ. And so God dealt with that. 
And so the first device of the devil that we don't want to fall prey to is to lose sight of, of how Satan will destroy a body if there isn't a stand for holiness and a stand for righteousness. But then a body can be just as destroyed if they make that stand, but then there is confession and there is repentance and then there isn't the forgiveness and the restoring of that person back into fellowship in the body, unforgiveness. And so the, the two devices, the importance of his device to introduce unholiness into the body and then uh, to uh, cause us to be unforgiving toward those that have repented. And so hopefully tonight we're all on a, uh, you know, the big uh, blackboard of our heart is all erased in terms of unforgiveness toward those that have confessed their sin and repented and, and, and all so that we don't uh, fall prey to one of the great devices of the enemy and then go into bitterness. And man, once it goes into bitterness, you know, against a person, the Bible says that many will be defiled and many always are defiled because we start to spill forth to everyone else and then it becomes a big mess. So it's a device of the enemy. We need to be very, very careful about it. So Paul speaks to the church at Corinth concerning it. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus, my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed from Macedonia. Now, this is very interesting to me. I have a tremendous interest in the Apostle Paul. I'm nothing like him, but I want to be like him. So I have a lot of interest in him. And here he is. He's in Troas ministering the gospel. And God opens a door for him. He's, he's being used by God very, very effectively in the city of Troas. But here he has sent um, Titus to go to Corinth and find out how the city of Corinth responded to that first letter, that exhortive letter, because Paul was uncertain how they were going to respond to it. And, and Titus didn't come back with word, any word and say, yeah, they, they listened to the letter, they received it, they were teachable, they were humble, and uh, they're still on board with everything. They still love you and all of that kind of stuff. Or, no, they hate your guts and, boy, don't ever go to Corinth again, as you might not get out alive. Paul didn't know how they were going to receive the letter. And, and this, I mean, this, this shows, shows me Paul's heart. He's, he's not a machine. He's not a preaching machine. He's not an apologetic machine. He's not an apostle machine. He's a human being. And what people think of him and how what he teaches and what he says is received is important to him. It's not what is supremely important to him. But he wants to be liked by people and accepted by people as much as the next person. And so he leaves this place even of effective ministry to go into Macedonia to try and might meet up with Titus and say, what's my relationship now with the city of uh, the church in Corinth? Again, his love for these people and, and for um, the work of God in that city. And when he heard from Titus that Paul listened, um, they got it. You did what God told you to do in writing that letter. And then God covered the other end and ministered that it was truth to them. So it was a good job all the way around. And when Paul finally heard that, he says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ. Isn't that the truth? But don't we worry in the meantime? <laughs> But when we're just obedient to the Lord and what He tells us to do, though it looks so uncertain for a while in terms of how it's going to play out, Paul kind of reveals what he learns from the circumstance. And what he learned from the circumstance is that, listen, as we just obey the Lord, do what He tells us to do, God will always lead us in triumph in Christ. And through us, He diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place for we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other we are the aroma of life leading to life. Every single one of us as Christians 
We have a fragrance. Not talking about a physical fragrance. Praise the Lord. But we're talking about a spiritual fragrance. There's a fragrance that is on our life, and it's called Chanel Number no. Five. No, it isn't. It's called uh, it's called Christlikeness. It's called Christlikeness. And the interesting thing, you, if you've ever had this happen, you ever been with somebody that has a very very strong fragrance on them, and you spend some time, uh, you know. Sometimes I'll I'll counsel and do counseling. And a woman will come in, and she's wearing very, very strong fragrance. And, uh, you know, by the time the session is over and everything, even with the air going and the window open and the whole thing, you know, you come out of the room and you smell like whatever the fragrances are. You know, you have, um, uh, yeah, and that's why you keep all the shades up when you're counseling and all the things and everything, so the accountability. But, but if you have, you know, like Aunt B or something like that, you know, and she wears a fragrance and, and you hug her, you know, and you hang around and that kind of thing, and you walk away from her and you've got that fragrance on her. Because when we're close to one another, we take on that fragrance. Well, you know, Christ has a fragrance. He wears a spiritual fragrance. And when we spend time with Him, that fragrance is left on us. And sometimes, that fra- sometimes we, the world is more aware of that fragrance on our life than even we are. We just spend time with Him. You remember when, when Mary of Bethany, six days before Jesus was going to be crucified, and, and um, uh, as he's, he's there with Mary and Martha and Lazarus in the house there in Bethany and everything, and she takes that... that a uh, box of value for perfume. She breaks it open. She anoints his feet with this fragrant ointment. And then, uh, having anointed uh, his feet, she then dries his feet with her hair. And it says, the whole house was filled with a fragrance. And as we, as we sit and commune with the Lord and we offer him worship and we praise him in all, there's a fragrance as, as we offer that worship. There's a fragrance that comes back on our life and it fills the whole house. And then we leave our quiet time with the Lord in the morning or whatever it might be and we go out into the world. Sometimes we can forget the fragrance is on us. But as Paul speaks here about this, it's the fragrance to one, you know, it's a fragrance that's a blessing. To another, it's a fragrance that it isn't, isn't a blessing to them. And the point is, is that everyone smells the fragrance. Not everyone likes the fragrance. Some people like it a lot. You ever run into Christians, you know, halfway around the world, you know, in Ceres or Keys or Salida or something like that? Or you run into a Christian anywhere and you smell the fragrance. I mean, you can, you can see him in an airport. You can see him in Rayleigh's. You can you say, I know that's a believer. You ever sit in a restaurant and you watch them pray for their meal? You watch a family stop and give thanks. They know where that food came from and all. You say, man, there's a fragrance on that life and it's a blessing. And then there are others, though. They watch you and I live for the Lord and it's a stench to them. They don't like the smell, but they notice the smell. And it, but it, it, that's a reflection of where they are. As it, as it relates to the Lord. So the fragrance, it gets noticed. And Paul realized, listen, you know, there's this fragrance on all of our lives. And Paul then said, and who is sufficient for these things? And, and as Paul looks at it, he doesn't say, oh, poor me, you know, I have to wear this fragrance. And it gets me in so much trouble in all the synagogues and in all the cities. You know, you can get stoned wearing a you know, fragrance like this and beaten quite frequently. And, uh, you know, almost torn limb to limb in Ephesus. And he, does, he looks at it and says, it is the privilege of my life to wear this fragrance. You know why? Because Paul had worn other fragrances. Jesus said, he who's forgiven much loves much. And when you've worn other fragrances in your life before you come to know the Lord, then all the junk that happens and all the persecution, all the rejection, all the things that happen as a result of wearing that fragrance, you look at it and you say, oh, no, this is my burden to bear. And you just say, Lord, I am so thankful for the privilege to be able to wear this fragrance to take your nature, to take your fragrance from the place at your feet 
and out into the world every single day. It's an honor. Don't feel sorry for me, Paul is saying. It's an honor and it's a privilege. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many peddling the Word of God, but as of sincerity, uh, and, but as from God we speak the, in the sight of God in Christ. So there were a lot of people in that time. They were peddling the Word of God, apparently there in Corinth also. They went into religion for a money-making thing. I remember one time years ago there was a fellow, maybe some of you would recognize his name, he was a televangelist, and all ended up in a tremendous scandal, financial scandal, and, and everything that he had told his friends when he got out of college. He said, I know the easiest place in the whole world to make money is in religion. And, and he went in and became an evangelist, made money, had homes all over the place and all this, this, this kind of thing. But th- that isn't new. People have been gone into religion to make easy money, you know, and to peddle the Word of God and, and make a living off of it and this kind of thing for ages. Paul said, we never peddled. We never did this for money. And, but we spoke the Word of God from sincerity. We spoke the truth to you. And, and we spoke what God told us to speak, and we spoke it in the sight of God. We spoke it as if God was sitting in that home Bible study listening to what we first preached to you there in Corinth. And that was his attitude. He said in chapter 3, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of condemnation to you or letters of commendation from you? Now, again, there were those in Corinth who were saying, Oh, the Apostle Paul, you know, he didn't walk with Jesus for those three and a half years like, you know, the other apostles did. And he's an apostle, that, but he's self-appointed and all of this, uh, this kind of stuff. And so they were, uh, you know, coming against him in this kind of way to such a degree that it, it seems as if they were wanting some kind of letters of recommendation, maybe from the other apostles, that Paul was actually an apostle. And, and, and so Paul said, listen, do I need a letter of commendation to you? Now, um, in, in those days, because they had a lot of speakers, a lot of teachers and evangelists traveling around, and some were legitimate and some were illegitimate. And so uh, you had some people that were peddling the Word of God. And so in order to try to filter between who was coming into town and just wanting to uh, get a bite to eat and a room to stay, you know, at the Holiday Inn Express and uh, go on their way uh, in the name of Christ and that kind of thing. They're all in it. They just want to see the world uh, being supported by the body of Christ. And, uh, and also they get a, a directory of all the Calvary chapels and just hit them as they go across the United States. And I remember a guy that did that a few years ago hit us and, and, and the whole deal knew everybody's name and all the, I mean, he knew the whole history. He was, he was very, uh, very, very clever. Got about 60 bucks out of us. That was the last time that. Anyway, um, he, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a 20 minute story and so I'm not going to go into it, but he was, he was good. I hope he has repented because if he hasn't, um, I hope he's repented because, uh, he'll want to. Uh, so, but doing this, so they, they started to require uh, letters of recommendation, a commendation. You remember when we finished the book of Ephesians and Paul closes out the letter of, uh, to the Ephesians and he speaks of uh, Tychicus, my beloved brother. It wasn't just that he was kind of saying, oh, by the way, this is the name of the guy bringing the letter. It was a commendation. It was to say, this guy's okay. He's okay spiritually. He's going to be a good influence. He comes recommended. Sometimes uh, people will want to come to this fellowship, whether uh, musical or they have uh, a drama ministry or teaching or whatever, and that, that kind of thing. And we always ask, if we don't know them, for a letter of recommendation. So when you don't know the person, you ask for a letter of recommendation from someone that you do know. And, and so you say, listen, if we were to turn this platform over to you on a Sunday night or a Tuesday night or whatever it might be, what would you do to the people that are here? And by the way, we need some letters of recommendation. And, and we always require that because otherwise, how do we know? 
that they're trustworthy. And so all of that kind of thing has been going on for 2,000 years because um, that's just the way that things are. But it's one thing to require a letter of, of recommendation from someone that you don't know, and they know you don't know. But can you imagine? Now, let's say you're at the church in Corinth. And God used the Apostle Paul to come in and birth that church, and you sit delivered from paganism and idol worship and the darkness of it because of his ministry to you, and now you're going to ask him for a letter of recommendation? I mean, why don't you just spit on him? I mean, how, how, how much could they do to try and hurt this man in, in, what, he, in, in what he was doing? So Paul says, do I need a letter of, of commendation from you? You are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. The fact that you're born again and you're not visiting those temples and bowing down to idols and slashing yourself with blood and all this craziness. You are our epistle, written by God. The fact that your life has changed is, an, is the evidence that God has called us and God is with us. And he said, you're known and you're read by all men. And I love that old saying. It talks about the fact that for us as Christians, you know, sometimes our lives is the only Bible that people will ever read. And that's the truth. And, but a life that's lived for the Lord, that, that's quite a Bible to read. It's a living thing that's happening. And people notice they're reading our lives. They're reading what God has done in our lives and he said, clearly you are an epistle of Christ. Paul said, listen, you're our epistle. You're our letter of recommendation of the fact that we are called by God to do what we're doing. But more than that, you're an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, uh, like a letter of commendation, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. And that's what we are. We're living epistles living letters to this world, and God writes His Word into our life. We then live that life out, and we're a letter from God to this world. Someone has said that the kingdom of God is an invisible kingdom that becomes visible through the obedience of God's people. And every time you and I obey the Lord in this world, then that living epistle comes forth. It's read. It's red. Why would they do that? Why would they be honest in that situation? Why would they not join in in the gossip in that situation? Why would they not take advantage of this stranger in that situation? Why would they do something different? And every time we live that different kind of life, it, they're reading the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And then Paul begins in verse 4 to uh, deal with uh, the Judaizers that are teaching there in Corinth. Uh, Paul had come in and he had taught the gospel, and that is every single one of us is saved by simple faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, that salvation is a free gift from God. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. But there were the works folks in there, the Judaizers who came in behind Paul, and they were saying, oh, no, you're not saved as a free gift. You're saved on the basis of keeping rules and regulations and earning your way to heaven and all this kind of thing. And by the way, we've got the latest list. And uh, we'll teach you all about those things. And they only cost uh, $249 a day uh, to be taught these things. And also they came in and they began to teach legalism there uh, in, in the church at Corinth. And so Paul said, and we have such trust through Christ uh, toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Paul said, listen, even though you are that epistle, even though God has used us the way that he has used us um, in your life and, and all, uh, that isn't the, the big thing. It isn't that we're something great or marvelous because uh, of the fact that God has used us in your life. He said the, 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 the whole sufficiency, it came from God. He's the one to be praised who made also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. That is, that salvation is based upon the blood of Jesus Christ. It's received as a free gift. That's what the new covenant is in Jesus' blood. A, a purchased, finished salvation from Calvary. So he says, listen, 
we are ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, speaking of the, the law of Moses, but of the Spirit. So these other teachers were coming in and they were teaching, no, 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 you're not saved by simply believing in what Jesus did upon the cross for your sins, but you're saved by keeping the law of Moses. Paul said, no, no, no. We were ministers of the new covenant. That's what the church was based upon. That's what the church was birthed upon. Not the letter, but the Spirit. For the letter kills, speaking of the law, but the Spirit gives life. Now, when he says the letter kills, he's talking about the law of Moses. Trying to work my way to heaven by keeping the law of Moses. Sometimes verse 6 is used as, as kind of a verse to say the letter kills, and, but the Spirit gives life. In other words... Um, the letter is the Word of God in, the, in its entirety. And, and so uh, too much teaching of the Word of God, that will kill a church. And, uh, but, you know, you've got to have a Holy Ghost hoe down and, uh, every, uh, pretty often here. Uh, but the Spirit gives life. And, and you even get this kind of stuff that goes on and, and where, you know, things are kind of the service will go and be this and it'll be that and everything. And people will walk out and say, well, it was such a great move of the spirit. I mean, there wasn't even time to teach the word of God and, and, and all. And, and so that that kind of of a deal, you know, the word of God is just this some kind of thing that kills a church. But just whatever the spirit would direct, it gives life. I'm not talking about that at all. It's talking about back, going back under the law. That'll kill you. That'll kill a relationship with God. But the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, and that's speaking of, of the law of Moses, written and engraved on stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And so Paul is talking about um, uh, Moses in Exodus uh, chapter 32 or chapter 34, where he went up on Mount Sinai and he received uh, the law from God. And when he came down and he delivered the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, he didn't realize it, but his face was glowing because of his uh, fellowship uh, with, with God there in that place. And then when his face was glowing, he, he covered his, his face. And, and, and so here you have the law of Moses uh, that he brought down. His face was just shining with an afterglow even from the law of Moses. So what, what Paul is saying here is just because I'm a minister of the new covenant, just because I preach what Jesus came to do, and that is salvation is on the basis of faith in Christ, don't misunderstand me to think that I'm down on the law of Moses. The law of Moses is glorious. It's beautiful. As Paul uh, wrote elsewhere in the New Testament, he said, there's nothing wrong with the law of Moses. If righteousness, a right standing before God could be attained on the basis of works, then it would be on the basis of the law of Moses. The problem with the law of Moses is that we can't keep it. No problem with the law. The problem with this is with us. And the law of Moses exposes us to be lawbreakers, that we cannot earn our own way into heaven. But there's nothing wrong with the law. The Ten Commandments are wonderful. Just don't think you can get to heaven on the basis of it. The 613 commands of the Pentateuch, they're all wonderful. You just can't get to heaven on the basis of it because no one can keep them and no one has kept them except Jesus. And so the law has a glory. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. But the weakness of it is that none of us can keep it. But if the law is glorious, verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation... And that's the trouble with the law of Moses. It's perfect. It's holy. It's right on. But it exposes us for not being perfect, not being holy, not being righteous. And that's why Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, he said, the law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It was given to expose us as sinners and to say to us every time we read it, 
You are less than perfect. You are less than perfect. You are less than perfect. Your righteousness cannot get you into heaven. And once we understand that to be the truth about our condition, then we cease from all attempts to establish our own righteousness before God. And we then turn to God and say, all right, then how in the world do we get to heaven and have a relationship with you? And then the Holy Spirit enters in and leads us to Christ, to the cross, to that free gift of salvation. And then we receive His righteousness put to our account. And now we have a righteousness that matches our need. For if the ministry of condemnation, that is the law of Moses, had glory, and it did, the ministry of righteousness, that's the righteousness that we have in Christ that comes through the gospel, it exceeds much more in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. So Paul is saying to these teachers and to those that are coming under the influence of these false teachers, he's saying, listen, I don't have a beef with the law of Moses. I'm not going to tell you it isn't glorious. What I'm telling you is that there is something that is more glorious, and that is salvation through Jesus And so the law of Moses has a glory, but compared to the gospel, compared to what Jesus did on the cross for us, it's like comparing a candle to the sun. There's no comparison. So Paul is speaking to them. They're coming in and they're undermining his teaching. They're undermining, they're attempting to undermine their salvation. So Paul comes in and he's, and he's, he's coming against what they're teaching so that people will understand, listen, don't trade what is infinitely more glorious for something that is glorious but inferior under the influence of these teachers. And he said, For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. So they're trying to silence Paul, these false teachers. And they're trying to undermine his voice and they're trying to undermine the message that God had called him to bring to Corinth. And Paul said, you'll you'll never silence me. You will never silence me. Because I know what it is to be where you are. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knows all about the glory of the law. But he also knows what it is to experience the glory of salvation in Christ Jesus. And he said, having experienced this and knowing the difference of the glory between the two things, he said, all it does is make me even more bold to declare the superior glory. Unlike Moses who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. This is something that Paul gives us insight into by the Holy Spirit. When Moses went and he met with God, and then his f- having a face-to-face experience with God, there was an afterglow left upon his life. There was a glow upon his life. And that's why when we come together to wait on the Lord and all and to meet with the Lord face-to-face and that, that special meeting that we have every quarter and all, it's called an afterglow. It's a time just to meet face-to-face with the Lord. We want to have that afterglow on our life. And Moses, when he came with the Ten Commandments or he came out of the tabernacle, there would be a glow on his life, and then he would put a veil over his face. Not so that people would not see the glow on his face, but so they would not see the glow fade from his face. To see the transience of that glow, the temporariness of that glow. And what Paul is saying is that the temporariness of that glow on Moses' face that, that ebbed away as, as, he, as he left the presence of God in, 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 the, in the tabernacle and all, it was a picture of the glory that comes through the law of Moses. It's a wonderful glory but it was never intended to be permanent. It was always intended that it would be temporary and that that glory, as wonderful as it is, would one day give way to the glory that is ours as Christians to have 
what God does in our life every single day as a Christian, which he speaks about uh, down in verse 18 when we get to that. But if but their minds, speaking of the minds of the Jews overall, were blinded to the gospel. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. And the great veil that the average Jewish person has concerning Christ that keeps them blinded to the truth that Jesus is their Messiah is self-righteousness. That idea that somehow I can keep the law of Moses and if I do a little bit better, you know, do more good in my life than I do bad, that that will be acceptable and God will let me into heaven. And there's a complete ignoring of the fact that there are no sacrifices being made for sins. There are no burnt offerings. There are no peace offerings. There are no sin offerings. There are no offerings being offered for sin today. Because there's no temple to offer them at. And why is there no temple? There is no need for a temple. Because the temple of God is now a living temple in, in God's people, in, in the body of Christ. But that veil that remains over their eyes is that idea that somehow the law of Moses was given in order that I might keep the law of Moses and in keeping it enter into heaven. And that is the prevailing view on the part of a Jewish person toward the law of Moses today. And Jesus came along and said that is a complete misunderstanding of the law of Moses. God never gave it as a means to get into heaven. He gave it to expose us as sinners and to cause us to seek a righteousness that only the promised Savior could bring. But that is that veil that's there today over the eyes of in the understanding of most Jews, but not all Jews. And it doesn't mean that they are without responsibility in this because he said because the veil is taken away in Christ. And when a Jew comes to know the Lord and accept Jesus as the Christ, all of a sudden, that veil goes out of the, out of the way, and all of, a sudden they, all, all of a sudden they've got it. And I don't, it's pretty exciting when a Jewish person recognizes Jesus as the Messiah because their head explodes because they've been raised in an environment where all of a sudden all of this thing just starts to come together because of their roots and because of, of what they know and their background as is, is Jews. And so that veil is taken away, as happened in Paul's life when he came to Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now oftentimes this can be used as a verse to uh, justify all manner of... um, Pentecostal excess in a service where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So let's have a hoot nanny now, you know, kind of a deal. I'm not, and I don't want to broad brush Pentecostalism and that kind of thing, but that's not what he's talking about here. It, 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 where he's talking about where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty not to do crazy things, but liberty from the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about here. There's liberty from the law of Moses. But not liberty now to sin, but liberty now to obey the voice of the Holy Spirit inside of us. It's called, Romans chapter 8, the law of the Spirit who is inside of us. We're not lawless as Christians. We have a law, but it's not the law of Moses. It's the law of the Spirit that's inside of us. But we all, so he's a southerner, he's from Atlanta. But we all, speaking of Christians, with unveiled face... Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. We know from James that the mirror speaks of the Word of God. As we behold the glory of the Lord, as we study His Word and we read His Word, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, we're being transformed into the same image, the image of Christ, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what does Moses do? Oh, I wish I was Moses. Oh, you don't wish you were Moses. I don't wish I was Moses. God bless Moses, but it was a different covenant. He was faithful to God in that covenant. But he met before God 
And there was a glory that was left upon his life, but then he had a veil because that glory was fading. We know no veil as a Christian. Every day we worship God with a face that is unveiled. No self-righteousness, no law, no this, no that. We have a relationship that is face to face with Him. And when we move out from sitting at His feet in the morning or whenever we sit at His feet, we don't have to worry about that glory fading because we're changed from glory to glory. Isn't it wonderful to be a Christian tonight? I mean... Aren't you growing so fast in your relationship with the Lord that from one week to the next you don't even know who that person was last week? That's how I feel every single week. Everything works in weeks for me. But that's, that's how I feel. That's the steepness of, of, of the growth. And, and, and so all the changes that are happening, you think, oh, it's just... You know, can't be any better than this, can't be any more glorious than this. And then he, you know, you find out he's even got greater light, you know, and he, and he pours and he changes us into greater and greater and greater Christ likeness. And so it isn't a life of having to hide, oh, we got this great big experience on the mountaintop, but it's going to fade and, and now we're going to look silly. But to live for Christ, it means that every single day as we continue to grow in him under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that after glow is stronger and stronger and stronger on our lives. All you have to do is just buy my program. It's called the Unveiled Face Program, and I'm selling it tonight. We're going to have a little booth out there in the fellowship hall. It's just $450 a week. And you can have glory to glory, you know, uh, experience. Experience all that's described here, but I know all the secrets to it. And I'll tell you how much of the Bible you've got to read every day, how long you've got to pray every day, and how many people you've got to witness to, and then how nice you need to be to me, and how many nice letters you write to me, and these kinds of things, and all that stuff. It's, it's all in the packet. But you know, you know one of the most beautiful things, and it's so good. I'm a born legalist. I am a born legalist. I am a born Pharisee. I, I just point me in a direction, and I'll I'll do it till I die, and and times a hundred with God. And so you know, it, and that's why we're so vulnerable to this whole works trip. And that's why they were in Corinth. They come in, and Paul speaks about. And, uh, and, and the people move away from grace. They move to works and they move to all of this because there's a legalist in us. There's someone that wants to, something about us that wants to try and make our salvation even more secure on the basis of our works. But it, it can't be more secure. But the beautiful thing about this whole thing, but we all, with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being. It's passive. It's passive. It's not something you do. It's not something I do. It's something that God does to us as we just keep our eyes on the Lord. Are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. He does it. He does it in our lives. And so we'll stop there tonight and pick it up, Lord willing, in chapter 4 next week.